Pineapple Pizza Podcast discusses the histories, cultures, and beliefs of regions around the world. These stories often contain mature and sometimes disturbing content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Pineapple Pizza Podcast, where we serve up scrumptious slices of mythology, cryptozoology, and urban legends. It's an interesting combination of flavors. Weird, but it works. I'm your hostess, Emily, and today you may have noticed we'll be serving up something a little different. The restaurant will be closed in August for some minor renovations. In the meantime, we're dishing out some classic slices of flavor from our other shows. In this episode of Ye Old Crime, Lindsay cooked up a truly bizarre story of a 19th century English mystery. One snowy morning, the people of Devon woke up to find strange hoof prints in the snow, which may not sound so unusual, except that they appear to have been made by a creature that was walking upright on two legs. Not only was this cloven hoofed creature bipedal, but it somehow seemed to have scaled large buildings and fences without causing any damage. Spectacular theories, Wild speculation and religious zeal certainly cooked up one wickedly weird cryptid. We hope you enjoy today's meal. Hello and welcome to Yule Crime where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hello. How's it going? It's going. Yeah. I've had a couple sips in my first cup of coffee, and I'm going to be really, really careful with it, because the last time (laughs) I was down in my office and had a cup of coffee... I was rushing to get on a work call because my headphones weren't working and my mic wasn't working. You spilled it. I like backhanded my cup as I was going to (sighs) plug in my podcast mic because my mic on my headphones wasn't working and it like splattered all over the wall, all over the carpet. It hit the surge protector. So I'm surprised I didn't start an electrical fire. Wow. So now I'm like, really? (laughs) <laughs> hyper aware of where my cup of coffee is. Yep. All it takes is one time. Yeah. I, I did that once where I backhanded my coffee and it just splattered all over. Luckily it didn't hit like the keyboard or anything, but it got really close to very important equipment. That's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a thing too. Cause this is a work laptop. So I was yep. like, Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> So I'm kind of glad I smacked it away from my computer, but at the same time, I was like, oh, God. Like, there's still, like... <laughs> Laptop's okay, but house fire. <laughs> well, there's still, like, coffee stains on my wall, but I wasn't going to paint in this room anyway, so it's fine. It'll just stay there for the six insane. months before I actually yep. paint it. <laughs> yep. And no one will notice but me. Yep. All right. So I know last week's episode was kind of, you know fanciful and whimsical and i originally had another sad crime story planned for this week yeah but i was like man there's a bunch of research involved in this one and i just don't i'm not (laughs) feeling it yeah so i picked this topic and it ended up having more research oh no (laughs) and this ended up being the first episode ever that i've had 10 sources wow So is that like universal karma? You like tried to avoid work and then inevitably ended up with more work. To be fair, (laughs) I think I think the first five sources are the ones that I got the most information from. And then I used the other five to kind of like verify stuff and and fill in some of the blanks. But yes, that is like Murphy's Law or whatever it's it's called. Yes. Mm -hmm. So and there is one source of reference material that I downloaded off of academia.edu, which is an amazing site, and I should use it more. Mm -hmm. But it was like 84 pages, and I was like, I'm (laughs) not going to read an 84-page paper. No offense to the man that wrote it, who I will like mention in the story, but 
I have it if I want to read it some rainy hey. day in the future. There you go. We'll have snow days. <laughs> there you go. Trust like, and believe. <laughs> there's like a blizzard outside, and I'm like, let's let's pull up that 84 page PDF and get cracking. Yep. Put it on a Kindle, make it feel more booky. There you go. So today we are going to be discussing the Devil's Footprints or the Devil's Hoof Marks. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Just like in general, like the lore behind it? There was a specific event we're going to okay. talk about. Where he showed up. Hey, guys. <laughs> he was like, hey, stamp, stamp, stamp. <laughs> Look at me. And the only response was, ah! <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what's up, bro? I'm just walking on through. I know. He's just trying to live his life. Stop being so judgy. His little satanic life. So information was pulled from the following sources. A 2017 The Ghost in My Machine article by Lucia. 2017 Mysterious Universe article by Brent Swanser. 2017 Sykes Cottages article by Dan Holmes. 2016 Mental Floss article by Stacey Conrad. 2016 The Vintage News article by Bobin Dosevsky, a 2014 BBC article, Atlas Obscura, the Peter Moore website, the Dark Histories podcast, and Wikipedia. All right. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. But heads up, this is in England, <laughs> and I didn't research how to phonetically say any of these places because I forgot. <laughs> We're going to have an extra large corrections cubby next week. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so have fun, international listeners, giggling at my horrible mispronunciations of your cities. You're welcome. <laughs> this goes out to you. Prepare for the carnage. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb yanks. <laughs> so Devon County, which is in southwest England near Cornwall and Dorset, offers quite a long history. It was one of the first areas of Britain to be settled at the end of the Ice Age, and is famous for a variety of things, such as the invention of cream tea, which is a combination of bread, clotted cream, and strawberry jam. So it's like little treats that you eat during tea. Oh, uh, okay. Because so it's like, oh, cream tea, that doesn't sound... Yeah. Particularly appetizing. Yeah. It's misleading by the name, but when I like saw what it actually was, I was like, that sounds delightful. <laughs> oh, strawberries. I know, I was like, mm, I want some of that. <laughs> the breeding of the Jack Russell in 1795. Oh, screw you guys. <laughs> Those dogs suck. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> burp, 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 burp. Oh, come mm. on, it's Wishbone. Wishbone was a Jack Russell. I didn't. But I didn't like that show either, so it's yeah. fine. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's a really hot take. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't like it, so. Thanks for that obscure Perfect. pop culture reference, Lindsay. They also boast the oldest working gin distillery in Plymouth and a peculiar event that took place the winter of 1855, Demons. which is what we'll be discussing. <laughs> Demons. Aliens. Alien demons. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun crossbreed. Demonic aliens that like cream tea. <laughs> this is That's delightful. Why, you know why the devil was there? He wanted some cream tea. Jack Russell Terriers. He was the one that bred them. He was like, hey, check this out. <laughs> hey, guys, want something really annoying, but also too useful for you to not have? <laughs> Jack Russell's. And then they like took all the gin and were like, peace out, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Like, hello, well, well, this is going to suck later when their working roles are gone and they're just house dogs. And they just annoy all the mailmen ever. I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kill, kill, kill. Circle, 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 circle. <laughs> so January through March of 1855 was a bitterly cold and harsh winter, marked by unusually heavy snowfall with temperatures rarely above freezing. In fact, it was the third coldest winter ever recorded in Great Britain, with wow. the average temperature hovering around 23 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 5 degrees Celsius. Babies. I know, I was like, I read that, and I was like, try negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit, so, <laughs> which we get in Minnesota. Yeah, with the wind chill of, like, negative 20. Yeah. Will my car start? I don't know. <laughs> Are my tears already icicles in my eyes? Yes. Have my eyelashes fused together? 
Yes. Yes, they have. Don't cry or you'll go blind. (laughs) (laughs) Don't open your eyes too quickly or you will rip out all of your eyelashes. What if that was like a really obscure art horror movie? Where they were like, don't cry in the snow. (laughs) All these people just like lose their sight just because of moisture. Yep. And they just start screaming and then their throat gets frostbite. Mm Mm-hmm. And additionally, the snowfall continued well into May of that year. Yep. Yeah, you guys keep complaining about this, but this is what we experience every year. Yeah. So no like, shit. Yeah, what do you mean? Snow in May? It happens. It's really devastating when it does. It's gonna be May blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right, back to, back to Devin. Many of the surrounding rivers froze, including the X and Tyne. So whenever it would snow, the piles would continue to grow and grow. And I I didn't include this because it didn't really have anything to do with the story. But it was an interesting anecdote that at one point, I think it was on the X River, they had this like elaborate like dinner party on the ice where they actually brought in like actual working stoves with like a bunch of fires and shit. Mm -hmm. And none of the ice melted. So so it was just like, damn. And the ice was so thick that they were like, they had like hundreds of people on there and didn't even worry about it. I watched a movie this past like winter break. And it was something similar to that where they had like, not only did they have like stoves and full on dinner parties, they had like horse drawn carriages going around the ice too. And I was like, those poor horses, how are they pulling that? (laughs) Yeah. Like, how is this happening? But I wonder if they gave them like special horseshoes that had like the spikes on the bottom or something, you maybe. know, like some boots do. So you can walk on yeah. the ice without falling and breaking all your everything in your body. Yep. <laughs> so even though the, the weather does play a factor in the story, our story actually takes place on the evening of February 8th, when mysterious footprints appeared in the snow all over on either side of the River X. Normally, footprints wouldn't be cause for alarm, but these were different. To everyone who saw them, they looked to be made by something with hooves that also walked upright like a man. Terrifying. Yes. The first report of the sightings was published on February 13th regarding the marks that were spotted in Dawlish. It reads as follows. Quote, Since the recent snowstorms, some animal has left marks on the snow that have driven a great many inhabitants from their propriety and caused an uproar of commotion among the inhabitants in general. The markings, to say the least about them, are very singular. The footprint, if footprint it be, is about three inches long by two inches wide exactly, in shape like a donkey's hoof. The length of the stride is about a foot apart, very regular, and is evidently done by some two-footed animal. What renders the matter more difficult of solution is that gardens with walls 12 feet high have been trodden over without damage having been done to shrubs and walks. The animal must evidently have jumped over the walls. End quote. Or it flew. Yeah, that's like some spring heel Jack shit right there. Yeah, it's the first form of the Jack Russell Terrier. <laughs> <laughs> You brought this on yourselves. It was a demon and then just shifted into a dog. And it was like, this is fine. (laughs) Just as much havoc like this. And then he rounded up all the sheep. Yep. A person only listed as spectator submitted a letter about the event that was published in the Exeter and Plymouth Gazette that reads as follows. Quote, Sir, Thursday night, the 8th of February, was marked by a heavy fall of snow, followed by rain and boisterous wind from the east, and in the morning, frost. The return of daylight revealed the ramblings of some most busy and mysterious animal endowed with the power of ubiquity, as its footprints were to be seen in all kinds of unaccountable places on the tops of houses, narrow walls, in gardens and courtyards enclosed by high walls and palings, as well as in the open fields. The creature seems to have frolicked about through Exmouth, Littleham, Limpstone, Woodbury, Topsham, Starcross, Tynemouth, etc. There is hardly a garden in Limpstone where his footprints are not observable, and in this parish he appears to have gambled with inexpressible activity. Its track appears more like that of a biped than a quadruped, 
and the steps are generally 8 inches in advance of each other, though in some cases 12 or 14, and are alternate like the steps of a man, and would be included between two parallel lines 6 inches apart. The impression of the foot closely resembles that of a donkey's shoe, and measure from an inch and a half, in some cases, two inches and a half across, here and there appearing as if the foot was cleft, but in the generality of its steps, the impression of the snow was continuous and perfect. In the center, the snow remains entire, merely showing the outer crust of the foot, which, therefore, must have been convex. The creature seems to have advanced to the doors of several houses, and then to have retraced its steps, but no one is able to discern the starting or resting point of this mysterious visitor, end quote. Yeah, that's really terrifying. If you saw those tracks like going towards your house and then leaving. Yeah, I would be like, what the fuck? Yeah, why is it trying to get in? <laughs> Cream tea. <laughs> Maybe the Jack Russell scared it away. And those were the houses that he retreated from. He was like, let me in, let me in. And everyone inside is sleeping, but they're like making the sign of the cross in their sleep. <laughs> and they don't know why. My arm really hurts today. So to summarize, something with small cloven feet, about the size of a deer's, walked about like a person would, had long strides, and was able to go from rooftops to gardens, from haystacks to open fields, through barns and across frozen lakes with ease. Some reports note how the prints seem to have melted or scorched into the snow from something radiating enough heat to melt through the layers of ice and snow. That's crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. Additionally, all the combined reports suggest that this creature traveled a distance of some 40 to 100 miles, or 161 kilometers. Yeah, that's a lot for, like, any creature. Yeah. In what, one night? In one night. Awesome. Tracks were seen in some 30 locations around Devon, including Exmouth, Topsham, across the X estuary into Dawlish, Tynemouth, Totnes, and Torquay, and as far away as Weymouth, or Dorset, and Lincolnshire. Crazy. The story of the footprints was widely reported, and people were so frightened that a group of tradesmen in Dawlish armed themselves with guns and bludgeons on the morning of February 9th, so like that morning, Mm -hmm. and set out in pursuit of whatever had made the tracks. The group walked from Dawlish to Luscombe, Dawlish Water and Oaklands, before returning without having found anything. One of the men in the party was quoted as saying, quote, The tracks had stopped and started suddenly in the middle of fields, as though they had been left by a bird or something more mysterious that had then taken wing. End quote. Wow. It is just super strange. Mm-hmm. There was another report I read that I forgot to put in here, where I think that party had dogs with them, and they were going to go into this wooded area, and I cannot remember for life of me, like, in what town it was, because I listed, like, 30, like, 20 towns right now. Yeah. But apparently the dogs went into the forest and then returned, like, yipping and, like, whimpering as if something truly terrifying was in the woods and, like, chasing them. And so the men were like, nope. (laughs) Yeah. And we're just like, we're going home now. Yeah, I would too. Dang. Awful. Just as with anything, some of the reports regarding the sightings and the details differ according to who reported it. In a piece published on February 24th, 1855, in the Illustrated London News, the hoof prints were described as being much larger, at four inches long by almost three inches wide, and that the prints were actually in a straight line, not side to side how a normal human stride would be, almost as if they were walking an invisible tightrope. Neo. Yeah. Additionally, they noted that the prince seemed to wander about with no rhyme or reason, as if it had no real destination in mind. Yeah, that kind of makes sense why it would travel so long to Mm -hmm. a destination. A quote from the newspaper on the incident reads as follows, quote, This mysterious visitor generally only passed once down or across each garden or courtyard, and did so in nearly all the houses in many parts of several towns about mentioned, as also in the farms scattered about. This regular track, passing in some instances over the roofs of houses and hayricks and very high walls, one fourteen feet tall, without displacing the snow on either side or altering the distance between the feet, and passing on as if the wall had not been any impediment. The gardens with high fences or walls and gates locked 
were equally visited, visited as those open and unprotected. Now, when we consider the distance that must have been gone over to have left these marks, I must say in almost every garden or doorsteps through to the extensive woods of Luscombe, that must have been the woods, upon commons and enclosures and farms, the actual progress must have exceeded a hundred miles, end quote. Wow. So one thing's certain, no one had an explanation for the phenomena. Some people suggested it was an animal of some sort, but given how unbroken the prints were, what type of animal could seamlessly scale a house to walk about on the roof, or in some cases, 14 foot or 4.25 meter tall walls, and be able to jump down into people's gardens without injuring itself? Yeah. And you would assume, too, that if it were a creature like that, it would be big enough for them to hear it land. Mm -hmm. Not only that. But tracks were seen leading to the river before suddenly reappearing on the far shore, as if its path had been unbroken, without actually crossing the river. Yeah. I realize that doesn't sound crazy, but how about when I tell you that tracks would be seen at one end of a small pipe, like like four inches tall, before reappearing perfectly on the other side, as if whatever it was ventured into the pipe and happened to waltz out the other side? No. Nope. I hate it. Yep. The spectator noted in his article to the Exeter and Plymouth Gazette that many of the poorer classes were full of superstition, believing it was the work of Satan himself or one of his many imps. Given that many of the prints walked up to people's front doors before turning and walking away, I'd be pretty freaked the fuck out, too. Yep. Like, whatever it was, it was trying to get into my house. The idea of whatever the creature was visiting Holmes reminded many religious-minded individuals of the plague of the firstborn in the book of Exodus, when God passed from house to house at midnight to slaughter the firstborn sons of Egypt, except for those who had marked their doors with lamb's blood. Yeah, except they didn't get a heads up. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> they just woke up and were like, what the what fuck? What? <laughs> so now I'm going to go into the theories of what happened. Okay. Many theories on what actually happened have been proposed over the years, and I'll address just a few of them now. I said I'd I address a few of them. I am addressing all of them. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> One report from a man named Major Carter is that the prints were made by shackles that were attached to the end of a, quote, experimental balloon, or the 17th century version of a weather balloon, mm -hmm. that had gotten loose from the Devonport dockyard around the time the footprints appeared. Apparently, this rogue balloon caused quite a number of property damage to greenhouses, conservatories, and windows, most likely from the shackles that were supposed to hold it down, and after it went down around Honiton, the matter was quickly hushed up. Interesting. Yep. But people poked holes in that theory, like, well, wouldn't the shackles have gotten caught up in, like, trees or something you, along the yeah, way? You would think so. And if it was... The shackles wouldn't it be dragging instead of just randomly touching down and leaving a bunch of prints in like yeah. straight lines. Yeah. And if it got up to someone's actual like doorstep, wouldn't it like knock against the door as it mm -hmm. flew away? Yep. So I call bullshit. <laughs> so that one's bunk. That one's debunked. Another theory is that the marks were made by none other than a kangaroo. Okay. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. Why the fuck would there be a kangaroo in Southwest England in 1855 in the middle of winter, of all things? I spelled England wrong in my notes. That's hilarious. <laughs> so according to researcher and author Mike Dash, and that's the one who wrote the academic paper that I mentioned, mm -hmm. which I don't know, who wrote an academic paper titled The Devil's Hoof Marks, Source Material on the Great Devon Mystery of 1855. Mm -hmm. A pair of kangaroos were at that time being kept as part of a private menagerie in Exmouth, near Sidmouth, by a Mr. Fish, and it's believed that one or both of them may have escaped. Hmm. Okay. So people probably might have just not ever seen their footprints before and thought it was half marks. Possibly. So along with this theory is the idea that one of the many other animals kept as part of his private zoo may have gotten out and created the prints, including a monkey and some wolves. Okay, but they determined it was a bipedo, and a monkey would not have large hoof prints. Yeah, so. and neither would a wolf. No. Another animal-related theory was proposed by the naturalist Sir Richard Owen in July of 1855. 
he suggested to the Illustrated London News that the prince could possibly have been created by a badger. His reasoning is as follows, quote, The fore and hind foot commonly more or less blended together, producing the appearance of a, of a line of single footsteps, which would make it appear bipedal rather than quadrupedal. The badger sleeps a good deal in his winter retreat, but does not hibernate so regularly and completely as the bear does in the severer climate of Canada. The badger is nocturnal and comes abroad occasionally in the late winter when hard pressed by cold and hunger. It is a stealthy prowler and most active and enduring in its quest for food. End quote. I don't like that theory just because of the jumping. Yes. Yeah. And when I first read that, I was like, well, why wouldn't it still have four prints? And apparently they walk in such a way where they would have been walking into the previous into the print. print. Yeah. yeah. Sir Owen's theory was contested by Rupert Gould, who noted the badger's rather wide tread, which would still cause two parallel lines of tracks, and the fact that no matter how hungry it was, there was no way it would be able to make its way to the top of someone's roof or scale a tall wall to enter someone's garden. Yep, I agree. Some people believe the prints were made by birds, which would explain how they appeared on the tops of walls and roofs, but there is no known bird that has hooved feet. Yeah. <laughs> they are all either webbed or clawed, so that mm -hmm. theory doesn't hold much water. Yep. Other racially and religiously motivated theories that were suggested state that people are to blame for the tracks. In one mm -hmm. instance, it's noted that a group of Anglicans were accused of making tracks in a churchyard in Topsham, even though these tracks appeared five days after the originals. And it was also believed that Romani travelers created the tracks to scare off other travelers and mark their turf. Yeah, that's that was a very easy race of people to blame. Yep. Funnily enough, the weather was also noted as a likely culprit. In addition to tons of snow on the night of February 8th, there was also freezing rain. It's believed that the rain could have fallen and frozen in a way that imprints that looked like tracks were created. But the BBC mm. noted in an article from 2014 that this type of phenomena has never been recreated, so it is pretty unlikely to be the true cause. Yeah, that makes sense. And how would it make such uniform tracks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they all pretty much look the same. I just pictured like a stencil in the clouds. Yep. <laughs> and the rain's just like, doop, doop, doop. <laughs> Some zoologists and naturalists of the day also wondered if the prints were the work of random otters or hopping frogs. But it's winter, so why would there be frogs? Yeah, they freeze. Yeah. <laughs> They're cold-blooded people. Yep. The most bizarre mammal being that of a unipede, which is a rarely sighted animal spotted by Icelandic explorer. I'm going to fuck this up royally. <laughs> Biome Hyrjolfsson in Labrador in 1001 AD. Pretty sure an ancient bipedal mammal wouldn't have just been like, I'm going to hang out for another, you know, 850 some odd years. And just land in this British area. Be like, I'm just gonna wander around, guys. But it, at the same time, um, they're saying it's the devil. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ancient mammal, devil. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Who's to say? Seriously, a theory was even proposed that rats and wood mice were to blame, but given the size of the hoof prints, they would have to be some giant ass rats, which is unlikely. And had a lot of teamwork. Yeah. And rats scurry, so they would be like walking over their own prints. Yeah. Although many hold stock in the wood mice theory, based on the fact that they hop and the tracks left behind resemble cloven hooves. So their feet kind of like, the toes kind of touch when they hop. Yeah, but would they be big enough for them? I don't think they'd be able to like sink that far in the snow through a layer of ice yeah. to make that sort of mark. Yeah. Finally, the theory of mass hysteria has also been proposed that there were, in fact, numerous footprints of some animal about town that people connected to one being as opposed to multiple creatures. Yeah, 
that kind of makes the most sense. Considering just how many different descriptions there are, instead of one creature making these prints, chances are it's multiple creatures. This theory is backed up by the fact that the prints in question appeared over a span of days in a number of places around the county. Mike Dash believes it's possible that the bulk of the prints, such as the ones made on February 8th, were made by the same creature, but that the rest were likely recreated by human hoaxers. Could be. Brian Dunning of the Skeptoid podcast believes the prints couldn't be demonic in nature at all and are likely blown out of proportion given that we only have illustrations to base our beliefs on and no photogenic, uh, sorry, no photographic evidence. That's fair. Fun fact, this isn't the first time that supposed devil's footprints have been reported. Okay. In the 15th century in Munich, Germany, there's the legend of the Der <coughs> Teufelstritt in Fraunkirk. I'm going to go with it. It's said that in 1468, architect Jörg von Halsbach was in need of money to buy a new cathedral in Munich and struck a bargain with the devil in which he would provide the funds for the build on the condition that it be a place with no windows so it would be a place of darkness. It's funny that he's an interior designer now. Yep. Upon completion of the build, Jörg brought the devil inside to see the work he'd done. It appeared as though there was no light and the devil was pleased until he stepped further into the building and the columns that blocked the windows parted, allowing the sun to shine through. Furious that he'd been bamboozled, the devil stamped his foot, marking the floor forever with his black footprint, which can still be seen to this day. That's a fun story. Yep. Except for the fact if you look at the footprint, it looks like it's wearing a shoe. <laughs> it's fine. He was like, I'm not going to hurt my hooves, people. Right. It's a priceless. An example in Scotland was reported in the Times on March 14th, 1840. So this is about 15 years before the one in England. Okay. And it reads as follows. Quote, Among the high mountains of that elevated district where Glenarchy, Glenlin, and Glenic <laughs> fuck <laughs> are con contiguous. There have been met with several times during this and also the former winter upon the snow, the tracks of an animal seemingly unknown at present in Scotland. The print of the foot in every respect is an exact re resemblance of that of a foal of considerable size, with this small difference perhaps that the sole seems a little longer or not so round. But as no one has had the good fortune as yet to have obtained a glimpse of this creature, nothing more can be said of its shape or dimensions. Only it has been remarked, from the depth to which the feet sunk in the snow, that it must be a beast of considerable size. It has been observed also that its walk is not like that of the generality of quadrupeds, but that it is more likely the bounding or limping of a hare when not scared or pursued." It is not in one locality only that its tracks have been met with, but through a range of at least 12 miles, end quote. Wow. In my last example comes from May of 1840, so the same year, on the remote Kerguelen Islands of the South Indian Ocean. The rocky, treeless, frozen land is surrounded by choppy gray waters and more than 2,000 miles or 3,300 kilometers from Madagascar Island. Nicknamed the Desolation Islands, this uninhabited island is home to little plant life and few animals. Captain Sir James Ross landed on the shores of the island during an expedition to catalog the life on the archipelago's main island of the Grand Terre. A small detachment led by Lieutenant Byrd began their trek around the island when they came across horseshoe-shaped, hoof-like tracks in the freshly fallen snow. Since the rest of their search of the island proved to be devoid of any large animal life, Everyone was baffled as to what had caused the tracks. Yeah. So one thing's for certain, no one has yet been able to explain the strange prints or what caused them, and chances are that no one will. Awesome. And that's the story of the Devil's Footprints. Nice. I like that. Yeah. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. I'm CJ, host of Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. My episodes focus on crimes committed by and against the LGBTQ community. I've covered cases you probably have heard of, such as Matthew Shepard, Brandon Tina, 
and the Orlando Pulse nightclub massacre, as well as some lesser known cases like the murder of Ray Hainish, the Australian gay beat murders, and the suspicious disappearance of Lisa Lynn Stone. I cover cases brought to me by listeners like Penny Brummer, who I believe was wrongfully convicted, taboo cases such as lesbian corrective rape and murder in South Africa, and pray the gay away camps. I discuss gay serial killers, women who pretend to be men to hook up with other women, and trans murders. I'm opinionated and uncensored. I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but surely I'm someone shot at tequila. No matter what your gender or orientation in life might be, please join me as I tackle rainbow crimes in search of unicorn justice. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. So this week's podcast plug is Beyond the Rainbow by our friend CJ. On her show, CJ shares tales of members of the LGBTQ community who have been victims of some truly heinous crimes. Mm. Crimes that more often than not have gone wildly underreported. Of course. In very rare instances, the perpetrators of the crimes themselves are gay, but I appreciate her show so much for bringing light to these cases and helping give a voice to the victims so they are never forgotten. Absolutely. And I also love her catchphrase, which is, it's not a crime to be gay unless you're a murderer. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. So if you're looking for a binge-worthy podcast, I encourage you to give Beyond the Rainbow a listen because you will not be disappointed. And I will include a link in the show notes. Check them out. And finally, this week's question is from Ariel of the Malice Podcast. And she wants to know if we have a favorite historical crime. I probably should. Would you like me to go first? Yeah. So one case that has always stuck out to me that I won't be able to cover because it happened too late, like past the 1900s. Is the Hinterkaifeck murders. Mm. And for those of you that don't know, the Hinterkaifeck murders um, is when a family was slaughtered with like half the family being found in their barn. Yep. And then I think like the mother and daughter and the maid were found inside the house. And there's like no clue who did it. And just a single line of footprints that, like, walk off into the woods. Yep. And the idea is that someone had been secretly living in their attic. Because prior to this, the murders, a previous maid had left the house after she felt like she had... After she had been hearing, like, sounds coming from upstairs. Mm-hmm. And felt like there were times when she was being watched. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah. I suppose mine would be the Basilica murders that are kind of similar, where the that whole family was murdered. It was murdered brutally with an axe. And they there's theories that there was a vagrant that used the train mm-hmm. and did it like all over the country, but they could never link him. And I always thought that that was really interesting because it it, it makes you wonder like. Um, it's it it's similar to you know like the East Area Rapist and stuff where like ha, was this just like a one off was this somebody who was super methodical and did it all the time was it somebody that knew the family was it a crime of opportunity yeah yeah I always want to know mm-hmm. and actually funnily enough there's a trend on TikTok right now where um it's people pretending to be in hell. And they'll be like, where or hell or heaven? And so like there was one in heaven and, and they were like, where is she? And God is like, what are you talking about? They punch God. Oh, God. <laughs> like, where is she? And they look at, and then all of a sudden it's John Benet Ramsey. And she's oh, like, who God. killed you? <laughs> <laughs> who killed you? <laughs> That's and the other one was um, the person going to hell saw Casey Anthony and like body checked her. <laughs> That's funny. Stupid and fun. Oh, TikTok. Oh, TikTok. 
Do you have something good you'd like to share this week? Um, yeah. So Willie, my golden retriever, gets groomed because you can't really shave a golden because they have hair, not fur. And it and it gets unruly and he gets like these like this hair grows between the pads of his feet. So he looks like his Muppet feet and they can get like knotted and it's really bad with the snow. So I got him groomed and I just really, really, really love his groomer. And it's always wonderful to see her. So I got to see her yesterday and, and catch up. And it was just really nice to talk to her and hang out nice. for a brief moment. Yep. <laughs> what about you? My something good is that my youngest gets to go back to in-school learning this week. Hey! So, I bet she's excited. Yeah, she's excited to go back and see her friends. And I'm excited that I won't have to teach her anymore. So, yeah, I bet, I bet that's not easy by any means. Yeah, because I've been teaching both of my kids since I think mid November. So it's been a long winter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it has. And then my oldest gets to go back the last week of January. And she'll go back to the hybrid model. Okay. So still. Well, at least she gets to be with her friends a little bit too. Yep. So it still will give me, what is it? Two days a week where she's gone. Mm-hmm. Or two days a week where there's no kids in the house. What will that be like? It'll be so quiet. <laughs> I'll be so productive. It'll be amazing. <laughs> Shall we? Yes. You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. Uh, you can email us at Yield Crime Podcast at gmail.com. I encourage you to send us your questions. We're mm-hmm. running out of listener questions, and it'd be great to hear what you guys think, hear what you guys want to hear from us. Yeah. Everything's free game, unless it's like crazy personal. Then it probably won't be. <laughs> In which case, no. <laughs> Um, A great free way to support the show is to leave a five-star rating and review. And this week's review that I'm going to be sharing is from Paige. And it was published on Podchaser, which is a great platform that you can use if you don't have Apple. So she leaves a five-star review. And she says, okay, these two seriously crack me up. The stories are usually weird ones that I've never heard before. I love that they designed an entire podcast around pre-1900s crimes, because some of these are messed up, Yep, but they're so entertaining. Not to mention the laughter between those these two is highly contagious. Dedicated listener, for sure. Aw, thank you. Yep. That's so nice. Yeah. If you can support us financially, but can't do so on a monthly basis, you can support us on Buy Me a Coffee. We're currently trying to raise $300 to purchase new audio equipment for 2021 and have currently raised $174 thanks to Emily from Drink Drunk Dead, Kara, Christina from Crime Lore, Bernadette from Murderific, and Mark, who actually bought us 30 coffees, which is beyond amazing. So amazing. We are so thankful for your support. It's just crazy. Thank you. If you can support support us on a monthly basis, you can do so on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. The dollar tier will still gain you ad-free access to our episodes. We also have uh, 5 10 and $15 tiers. And lastly, you can also support us by purchasing merch on our Tee Public store. And we are currently doing another fundraiser for Can Do Canines with a limited edition Willie design. Mm-hmm. Which will be available through... The 27th? The 27th, I believe, yes. Yep. Willie birthday merch. Will, cause, yes, because January is Willie's birthday month. Mm-hmm. Which is why we're doing another fundraiser. Yep. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Maddie. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime.